Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Lonnie Edgar, and I'm with the Joint Committee on Performance Evaluation and Expenditure Review for the State of Mississippi. On behalf of the National Conference of State Legislatures, I would like to welcome all of you to today's webinar entitled Community Health Center's Role in the Health System Now and in the Future. Uh, today's webinar will explain how health centers operate and how their patient mix presents funding challenges. Health centers must rely heavily on third-party payer reimbursement such as Medicaid, CHIP, and Medicare because of their mission to serve the uninsured. The uninsured are the largest group served by the health centers, but they account for less than 6% of their total revenue. The webinar will also discuss the impact of Medicaid eligibility or benefit changes on health centers as well as other issues facing health centers in the coming years. Uh, we are very fortunate to have two experts joining us on today's webinar. The first is Don McKinney with the National Association of Community Health Centers and Dr. Tony Amofa with the um, <clears throat> Community Health of South Florida. Our webinar today will conclude with a question and answer session. Uh, please note that you will not be identified when you ask a question, nor can other participants see what you have typed. Uh, just as a quick reminder, you may participate by clicking on the Q&A button and at the bottom right corner of your screen and typing in your question there. Uh, just an also a side note on the logistics, we will also post this PowerPoint presentation on the NCSL website as well as the audio archive of the webinar. Uh, so first off, just to kind of give you a little quick overview snapshot of what uh, community health centers do and who they serve in Mississippi. Uh, just to start with the basics, uh, obviously community health centers, a federally qualified health center uh, commonly referred to as an FQHC, is a community-based nonprofit or public organization that provides services to people who lack access to other health care based on a medically underserved area or population. Uh, these are typically tried to be placed in high-need areas uh, with the greatest barriers to care. Uh, because I also mentioned uh, FQHC lookalikes, uh, just a quick definition for that, is basically these are the same things as an FQHC. They meet all the same requirements, but they do not actually receive federal funding. So just to kind of give you an overview of the structure of the federally qualified health centers in the state, uh, in Mississippi we have 21 organizations that monitor and oversee the delivery sites for the federally qualified health centers. Uh, primarily this is done through the Mississippi Primary Health Care Association, and this turns into about actual 188 federally funded delivery sites across the state. Uh, in addition, when you actually take into account all of the federally qualified health centers and this lookalike site, we have about 208 delivery sites total throughout the state. Uh, these lookalike sites will also include things like the rural health centers, the school-based health centers, and these also include both permanent health centers as well as seasonal. Uh, just to give you an idea about how many people in 2011 were seen at one of these delivery sites, it's about 324,000. Uh, this is a big change compared to about 150,000 that were seen about 10 years ago. So really the people who are participating in access, actually accessing these uh, health centers have more than doubled in the past 10 years. Uh, to give you a quick idea on basically who these community health centers employ, uh, in Mississippi it's roughly 1,600 full-time equivalent staff. Uh, the top three categories are the most staff are comprised of first nurses, uh, second nurse practitioners, as well as physician assistants, and then lastly, physicians. Uh, as a result of these staff, uh, they were able to provide in 2011 approximately 903,000 patient visits. So basically, just to give you a little picture on who was actually receiving these services, as I stated before in the introduction, uh, these are primarily geared to serve and provide access to the uninsured. Uh, Mississippi in 2011, 41% of the people who accessed community health centers were uninsured. Uh, the other largest contributors were Medicaid at 31%, Medicare at 10%, and then other forms of public and private insurance at 18%. So really, as you can see in Mississippi, about 82% of the people who use these services are either uninsured or in some form of supplemental assistance. And why did, these, why did this population go and actually access these services? Uh, particularly these that are provided for medical conditions as well as preventive services. In regards to the actual medical conditions they sought treatment for, uh, the top ones being hypertension, diabetes, asthma, depression and mood disorders, and heart disease. On the preventive side, uh, primarily this is one of the key access points for people without insurance or without access to get their oral exam and a lot of dental work. Uh, also, well-child visits were very high on the list. Um, PAP tests as well as immunization. So 
at this point, I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker. Don McKinney serves as the Director of State Affairs for the National Association of Community Health Centers. Uh, she works with the state and regional primary care associations on their legislative and regulatory agendas. Her main areas of focus currently are the Affordable Care Act implementation, including Medicaid expansion and health insurance exchanges, and payment reform. Her work is focused on tracking health care policy across the country and identifying trends that impact health systems. Uh, after Don concludes speaking, we will hear from Dr. Tony Amofa, who is the Chief Medical Officer for Community Health of South Florida, as well as Medical Director of the Health Choice ne Network. He is responsible for the oversight and direction of Community Health of South Florida's clinical programs and services. As the Medical Director of the Health Choice Network, network Dr. Amofa responsibilities include provision of clinical guidance to the network's research and care management programs and the quality improvement program. He is also a board certified internist, and Tony also obtained his MBA with specialization in the health services administration from the University of Miami. And at this point in time, I will happily turn the floor over to Don. Thank you, Lonnie. Good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate this opportunity to speak with all of you today. I'm Don McKinney, the Director of State Affairs at the National Association of Community Health Centers, and I'm going to walk through a little bit more in depth about uh, health centers and who we are, what we do, who we serve. So to start with, um, the five basic characteristics of health centers, as, as Lonnie mentioned, health centers are located in high need areas, both urban and rural. It's actually roughly um, evenly split, uh, which are medically underserved. They provide comprehensive care, which I will describe in more detail shortly. They serve all regardless of ability to pay and are governed by community boards, which means at least 51% of the board members are patients of the health center, making them more responsive and accountable to the communities that they serve. Health centers are also held to strict performance standards. In terms of the types of health centers, I, you did hear Lonnie um, talk about F, FQHCs, um, um, we, which is what we call federally qualified health centers for short. Of those, there are different types, um, community health centers, migrant health centers, healthcare for the homeless, and public housing. FQHC uh, lookalikes, as Lonnie mentioned, meet the same requirements but do not receive grant funding. These are just these are uh, the services offered by health centers, um, and it may vary slightly from health center to health center. But this is at the the core. At um, vast majority of health centers provide all of these services. So, as you can see, health centers offer extensive services, not just primary care, but mental health, oral health, pharmacy, and much more. In particular, I think it's worth noting um, what health centers provide in terms of enabling services, which makes them unique. Um, they provide a, a range of services, as you can see, um, including case management, transportation, translation, and others. Again, this is something that would be um, expanded upon or, or different from health center to health center based on the needs of any given community. Health centers have been around for 47 years and currently serve 22.3 million patients at 1,200 health centers at over 9,000 sites across the country. So 1,200 organizations that, that have 9,000 sites. Um, health centers have been cite cited for their achievements and have broad bipartisan support in Congress. And as you can see, health centers serve one in seven Medicaid beneficiaries one in seven uninsured persons, including one in five low-income uninsured, one in three individuals in poverty, and one in seven rural Americans. As you can see, health centers have a unique payer mix, serving a significantly larger percentage of Medicaid, 39%, uninsured at 36%, and a smaller proportion of privately insured at 14% than other providers. You saw one state example from Lonnie in Mississippi um, about where health centers revenue comes from. Here's a closer look at health center revenues nationally. Medicaid makes up the largest percent. Um, federal grants are actually only 16.5%. Um, 
state support falls into the other grants and contracts category. Here's a look at Medicaid as a percentage of revenue by state, so you can see how your state fares um, and compare to your neighbors. <laughs> An additional, um, many of you on the phone may actually be well aware of the state, the support that your state provides to health centers. This is a look at nationally what it looks like. In fiscal year 12, 35 states provided a total of $335 million in state funding to health centers. This was actually 15% less than was, re than was reported in fiscal year 11 uh, due to the economy and the strained state budget. State funding for health centers has been declining for four years, and fiscal year 12 represents a seven-year low at a time when the needs really have continued to rise steadily. Health centers improve health and consequently save money by reducing emergency room use and hospital admissions and reducing health disparities. Overall, patient costs are 24% less and save approximately $24 billion a year. Health centers also act as economic engines in their communities. The next map shows you again um, by state the economic engine effect that health centers have in their, in their state. This is somewhat outdated data. It's from 2009, and we um, are confident that that obviously is increasing. Um, as health centers grow and continue to, to um, hire more staff and serve more patients. And in terms of dollars, the next table, I know it's a little hard to read, but I wanted you to be able to see, look at, take a quick look at your state and see what the impact is of the health centers in your state. Nationally, it's, we estimate it's a $20 billion impact at, with 138,000 job, full-time jobs at health centers. So I think we all know what the Supreme Court decided. Um, the, what's important today for this discussion is that is ultimately that Medicaid expansion is a state option. Um, right now it looks like 24 governors have said uh, yes to expanding Medicaid and another four are leaning that way. 14 have said no, um, another three are leaning that way. Five have not decided or commented. But of course, as legislators, you know um, and are acutely aware that this is only part of the picture. Uh, in most cases, the decision will actually come down to the legislatures. Regardless of the state's decision on Medicaid expansion, what health centers can do is provide outreach and enrollment, um, provide a health care home, and continue to serve all regardless of ability to pay. In terms of what legislators can do and to support their health centers, um, continuing to provide state, state funding, which can enable health centers to serve more uninsured or expand services, lengthen hours, make capital improvements, and strengthen the workforce. They can maintain and expand Medicaid and CHIP, which is vital to health centers' financial el eligibility, I'm sorry, financial viability, and the main source of coverage for patients we serve. Strengthen the workforce to meet the growing demand um, by revitalizing state health care workforce programs and licensure laws, supporting loan repayment for primary care providers working in medically underserved areas. And for a more detailed look at what's, what this, all of this means for health centers at the local level, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Amofa. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm still waiting to be able to move the slides, um, Melissa. Okay, thank you. 
Okay. Um, again, my name is Tony Amofa, and friends, I want to say thank you on behalf of myself and my CEO, Mr. Bodis Hadley, um, for the privilege to participate in this conference call. <clears throat> also, I want to say thank you to Lonnie and Don for setting the stage for my part of the discussion. Um, what I'm going to talk about, um, in short, for some of them, and in, in, some, in detail in some of the other ones, is to give an overview of my health center, Community Health of South Florida. I will share with you a typical story of a CHI patient. And then I'm going to talk about the value that I see health centers playing in the current health system. And I just abbreviate as CHCs by referring to all the different um, federally qualified health care um, systems that we have. And then I'll talk about perhaps what the new health system holds for health centers and what Medicaid expansion might mean to Florida health centers, including my own, what would happen to my patients with or without Medicaid expansion. I'll share with you some of the things we're doing in Florida and other health centers across the country in positioning ourselves um, for healthcare reform. And, and perhaps here's some of the exciting things I think all of us, including my health center, can play in the new healthcare system. And then you know I can end without sliding in there, maybe some thoughts as well on how policymakers can help health centers accomplish this and then maybe end with a take home message. So um, my health center, Community Health of South Florida, where I'm the CMO, um, was founded in 71 with services in two trailers um, because of community concerns about existing health disparities. And it's in a sense expanded into seven health centers, 31 school-based clinics. The four more centers to go this year. Currently, 60 provided 600 staff, projecting perhaps 80 and 700 this year with staff who represent over 30 different and distinct cultures and providing over 63,000 patient visits to, I'm sorry, providing services to 63,000 patients with over 83,000 visits. And with quality services um, as accredited by the John Commission and with medical home certification by the John Commission and level three with NCQA. I'm not gonna review all of these services because I think um, it's been clearly underscored by the previous speakers. But just to say that um, Community Health of South Florida, for example, has um, two urgent care centers um, provided last year over 10,000 visits um, to patients, many of whom would have ended up in a local ER. So we're very excited about that service we will provide. We have um, four pharmacies um, generated over, over 100,000 prescriptions last year alone. And we have such an extensive behavioral health department um, with all of the usual bells and whistles, including a 24-7, 16-bed inpatient crisis stabilization unit, and serving as the only CSU um, all the way down south that can accept big active patients. And so a typical patient um, who would have received all of these services would have come in through our walk-in service, um, perhaps, or, or through a referral from another PCP, um, it could be a mom scheduled to see a family practitioner and with a child to see a pediatrician at the same time, picked up by transportation services. And with their visit, they would have received their, all their shots, their screenings, um, even developmental and depression screenings. Um, in most of our main sites, we have folks like embedded behavioral health consultants right in primary care who, who the patient could have seen if they had a, a, a behavioral health problem that was obviously impacting on the chronic disease or other, a nutritionist, a medication assistance worker, and sometimes even a WIC person who visited by such a patient um, would perhaps receive an appointment from a dentist, for a dentist or optometrist, we, uh, would have received medications from one of our pharmacies with significant 340B enabled discounts, lab x-rays done on site, driven home by transportation, with a follow-up call to check on them by our staff, and perhaps a pre-visit call to prepare them for the next visit, also by our staff. Um, and since the patient would, would fit one of these profiles, I'm going to go through all of that, but they're likely to be a minority, to be uninsured on, on Medicaid, and below federal poverty level, very similar to other patients in Florida health centers um, in terms of their profile. So I've had the privilege of working in a health center right out of internal medicine residency. Um, and I've grown to truly appreciate what we're able to offer to our patients and the communities they serve. And so this 
slide just outlines some of the key ones. Um, I think the first two bullets on this slide actually highlight what I think are the most valuable ones. Um, as you know, um, most, if not all, all, all of the health centers were born out of a community need to address pressing health disparities. So as a result of this, and the regulatory requirement for health centers to perform periodic community needs assessments, um, it has continued to keep health centers grounded in this community-orientedness. And that, I think, is a very valuable role health centers play. Um, health centers also serve as medical homes, um, and we know that the uninsured and Medicaid are more likely to receive uh, services in, in a health center. In fact, um, we learned that as a result of the economic downturn, um, the potential drop that was expected with percentage of adults in Florida receiving a dental visit, um, that was initially about 68%. We expected that to drop to 50, way less than 58%. It stayed there because health centers existed and they were able to, and most of them, provide preventive dental services. So that was very exciting for me to, to learn, and it's exactly that in my health center as well. Um, additionally, health centers having that primary drive um, to integrate behavioral health care into primary health care, um, something that happens in two-thirds of our Florida health centers, has been a big value. And then, as was mentioned in, uh, by previous speakers, a whole array of enabling support services um, make health centers stand out uh, in the communities we serve. Um, but outside of even all of that um, um, health and quality, there is there's, there are a number of very good business reasons for the existence of health centers in under-resourced communities that they serve. And when you take a look at um, across the country, we know that health centers provide um, per patient costs annually that are, are comparatively less than in other health settings. In Florida, in one study that we looked at, it said that Florida health centers cared for 12% of, of the Medicaid population. However, their yeah, Medicaid payments accounted for about 1% of Medicaid ambulatory care spending. I think that's you know, certainly worthy of note. Um, the ability of health centers to also provide employment in communities is also um, very neat indeed. In my health center alone, we provide um, job opportunities for over 600 people. And we're talking about mothers and fathers and daughters and sons who would otherwise have worked in other counties or other states, perhaps, if the health center did not exist. In fact, health centers in rural areas are often among the largest employers, um, and their survival really drives the survival of that, that, um, those communities. Um, as Dawn shared recently, um, in, the, in the slides, 87 million in, in business, this is in Florida alone, um, generated in challenged neighborhoods. In my health center, our economic analysis showed that there was a budget of, budget of about 45 million and in economic activity we generated, including construction work, food and cleaning services, banking, all that, another almost 50 million, almost 94 million in economic activity, just from my health center alone. Um, and I think that's, that's pretty neat. So what does a new health system hold for health centers? I'm not going to go over this slide. I think most of us are very much aware of this. The National Association of Community Health Centers prepared for us, um, outlining new funding, expansion, payment reform, workforce, and so on and so forth. But I'd like to just underscore Medicaid and what, um, what it holds for health centers, Medicaid expansion as an aspect of health care reform. Uh, we're very excited about the fact that um, um, Medicaid expansion in Florida would, would do a lot of things for us in Florida. Um, Florida is, I'm sorry, um, Medicaid is the single largest source of revenue for health centers in Florida, over a third of total SQC revenue. That's significant. Um, and state and local grants make up only 13%. I really wish it would be way more than that. Um, but in addition to the revenue stream Medicaid expansion would provide to our health centers, um, across the state and the country. I'm quite pleased about the fact that um, there will be extensions in coverage um, for things that are quite important um, up front and then downhill, preventive health services. And something I put in there, something as seemingly little as smoking cessation in pregnant women and, and the lives that would, it would save by the provision of this coverage. So I'm going to talk about what would happen to my, my patients with or without Medicaid expansion um, just underscoring the fact that health centers would always be there, um, hoping that other state and local governments will help to make us more and more successful, regardless of what happens at the federal level. Um, but worthy of mention of uh, the fact that there would be um, some pros and cons, obviously. Um, and I put out this visual slide um, to just 
um, represent a summary of how I see it with my patients and the communities that my patients come from of what could happen directly or indirectly. So directly through my health center in either our clinical, physical, operational um, activities in terms of access to care, preventative care, care outcomes, workforce, viability, and just administrative activities, as well as indirectly um, on the healthcare and economic activity of the communities my patients come from. Uh, so this would be a good visual. Um, that would then lead into my next slide, which is clinical. Right? What would happen to my patients? Um, we know that, yes, with medical expansion, hopefully there will be improved access to care for, the, for newly eligible and better care outcomes. Fewer residents would lose their health insurance, more health, mental health patients, homeless patients, low-income veterans would have coverage. In fact, we know that um, Medicaid expansion would cover 60, 650,000 of the 1.3 million currently uninsured veterans, um, almost 60% of them not in regular care. I'm uh, excited about the fact that it could also help reduce health care disparities and slow down the spread of HIV disease, um, as well as provide more resources for recruitment and retention, especially for primary care clinicians. But without Medicaid, health centers would always be there to continue to provide access to primary and preventative care for the uninsured, except, yes, we do expect that waiting lists might get longer um, as, as um, the populations increase. Um, in terms of residents that lose health insurance when they lose their job, um, health centers will be there, um, continue to be that medical home. And um, the last week, or last week I saw a, a patient, um, uh, a young woman who had lost a job, lost insurance, and, and, hence, and, and the PCP, their primary, primary, primary private clinician, could longer, no longer see them. They needed their hypertensive medications and, 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 and was able to come in to, to see me. Um, and also, we'll see here, regardless of insurance status, um, this is what, this is, what the, this, is, this is a difference that health centers make that I'm excited to be a part of. Um, ability to continue to be accessible to the homeless and, 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 and put patients with mental health is another one that we will continue to be there for. Um, um, as well as providing the outreach and enabling services um, and, and, um, and transportation, all those kinds of things. Um, and last part, because, yes, we do also have state and local governments that help us to pick the slack. Um, for example, in 2009, we learned that state and local governments had to cover almost half of most of the mental health expenditures in community health clinics, state mental, mental hospitals, and hospital ERs. Uh, so I guess what I'm saying is that without Medicaid expansion, um, uh, the safety net will exist and, 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 and looking at other funding streams and doing the best we can. We certainly can't be there, uh, but it certainly will not be easy at all um, if we pulled out all of the plugs. Um, in my health center fiscally, um, obviously with Medicaid expansion, we expect to be um, stronger in financial viability and being able to absorb less of the cost. Um, of, of the uninsured. Um, operationally, and one of my staff drew my attention to this one, I thought it was very interesting. Um, it talks about, the, and you're talking about the fact that operationally, Medicaid expansion has this benefit of reducing the administrative burden of having to verify the ever changing insurances. And she was saying that she's so excited that's going to be a possibility for her because they spend a lot of time doing this. So that's kind of interesting. So that's something that we are kind of excited about that Medicaid expansion will provide. Obviously, without Medicaid expansion, we, it's something we're going to continue to do, but um, it does certainly take away from patient care time, um, and, 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 and it's something we try to, to avoid and try to channel staff's time to direct care for patients. Indirectly, how, uh, Medicaid expansion would, will have some effects on the community, and I'll just share with you uh, my opinion about um, some of those in my health center in the community, in the, in the community that uh, we, we provide services to. Um, I do expect that in terms of health care, certainly with medical expansion, CHI adults will be less likely to move to other states. In fact, interestingly, I, I saw a patient maybe a month ago, and I remember this clearly. This patient moved from California um, to Florida and, and, and came in to see us in the health center. He moved because he thought that he was going to be more likely to obtain Medicaid. Um, and, and eventually realized that it was no easier. Um, he continued receiving services until he decided to move back and we were able to link him up to another health center on the other side and send all this information and stuff like that. Um, but it, did, it made me appreciate that this is actually real. Um, patients will move around states for the best benefit. But again, that's where health centers come in. Without Medicaid expansion in terms of health care, 
while there's a potential loss in continuity of care, um, health centers try to provide that. Um, and with aggressive engagement in health information exchange, we think that even when patients have to continue to move in and out of states and insurance and chain providers, we might be able to help um, send information across to reduce the impact of, of, of these changes. Uh, we do expect with Medicaid expansion, there will be less use of emergency rooms. Um, and even without it, as health centers will continue to aggressively educate on the availability of primary care. Um, it, it, I saw this patient actually just yesterday. She, interesting, she, so she has Medicaid. She's seen a, one of the clinicians in the community. Um, she has high blood pressure, uh, quite morbidly obese. Uh, she came in to see me because she changed um, insurance and the PCP wouldn't carry that insurance any longer. Um, in our health center, we can try to cover almost every insurance that exists. But the interesting thing was, she said about a month before she came, she had run out of, out of the medications. Her blood pressure hit like 160 systolic, which is you know, medium high. And she went to the ER. And I thought, wow, we have an education center here. If she had come in to see, you know, she was seeking her here, she would know about the service. Um, so while there's an opportunity to, for health centers to aggressively educate on these services, I realized that in my health center, we continue to aggressively educate on the agent care centers we have and how they can prevent ER visits with or without Medicaid expansion. Um, the economic activity um, impact of Medicaid expansion is also real. Um, I have a few patients who've had to borrow money to pay for health care needs, um, especially hospital care. And patients who have had to worry about limiting how much work they do because if they work too much, make more money, they'll lose their Medicaid. Uh, and at, when he hears these stories, just incredible um, in, in the trenches. Uh, and so at least I, I'm excited that I'm there with my center and, and our clinicians and, 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 and our teams to provide services to all these patients, regardless of what their circumstances are, uh, meeting the needs the best we can. So I think regardless of what happens um, to Medicaid in all the states across the country, health centers will be there to help cushion um, the impact unless obviously states also decide to cut their spending to health centers significantly. Now that would be a shame, I would think. Um, and we hope that, um, that or, you know, all of that as in supporting the safety net would exist um, to help to make sure that um, uh, between federal, state, local, private funding, that health centers will exist to, to do that. Um, recruitment and retention will certainly be additional challenges um, that we continue to work with, and we're excited that healthcare reform makes it possible for us to recruit more National Health Service scholars. Um, and a big challenge of finding specialists um, is something that we're all working on now, finding our own networks in our communities to meet the, need of, the, the needs of our patients. So with all of this going on, um, health centers obviously um, are strategically positioning themselves to success regardless of the direction of healthcare reform, Medicaid expansion and funding and so on. And, and very important for us is continuity of care, developing alliances, other, other local, local healthcare providers, participating in health information exchange to make sure that um, this, this, this need information sharing um, seamlessly um, we can um, and patient information back and forth. Um, making sure that we're remaining competitive with, with um, service excellence and facility and technology, technology upgrades, something that we're, we're all working on. Um, and obviously, any support to make that happen, uh, especially um, encouraged. Um, continuing to provide community education and, and, and assisting with insurance eligibility applications um, for patients currently who exist in our communities and we're not taking advantage of. Um, um, Medicaid and Medicare and all the others that exist right now, but also um, um, better accounting for all the enabling services, services we provide, transportation and translation and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and we are actually um, doing better with that uh, so we can demonstrate that added value. Um, and we're also learning um, the value of becoming um, part of health center controlled networks and utilizing economies of scale to improve outcomes in all of our communities. I'm quite excited about the role health centers will play in the, in the new healthcare system. I, I am so, I feel so privileged, and my my clinicians say the same. And we hear that from health centers across the country um, that that health centers have a big role. And I think everybody or most people really appreciate that. But as medical homes, especially with our abilities to ramp up with relative speed um, and a commitment to all the enabling programs that we know make a difference, 
uh, I think we'll, we'll some a, a, a role that will continue to play, um, providing the best opportunities to reduce health disparities in the areas of most need. Um, we also see that um, again with with um, health insurance reform, uh, there's going to be a need to enroll thousands, if not millions, of people. And, and that historically has never been easy, uh, but I think the health centers are positioned to be able to reach to the areas of biggest need and with the relations we have, help people kind of come out and to be comfortable in enrolling. Um, we also know that um, you know, beyond hospitals and, and um, medical school settings or residency training settings, health centers perhaps present one of the best training grounds for clinicians. And so we, we see, see health centers playing a huge role there and I'm excited that healthcare reform with facilitating health centers, setting up, um, setting up to become teaching health centers is, is a step in the right direction. I also see health centers um, pre presenting an interesting role as research institutions. Um, traditionally, minorities have not been included in lots of clinical trials. And so newer medications and, and, and newer devices um, don't get to be tested enough in minorities. And I think that health centers stand, stand a chance to play this role and be successful, certainly as economic engines, um, but if nothing else, to we'll provide that in into minority communities where trust and relationships we've built would really make a difference. I certainly cannot end without making a, a comment. Um, and, and so to the, to the NTSL and, 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 and others, um, uh, that can best support CHPs, in my humble opinion. Two things. Um, continue to, to ensure that their direct investment in health center capacity, I think, will be a, you know, a step in the right direction. And ensuring that health centers are in the forefront of any strategies to increase access to affordable health insurance, I think it's something that we cannot get around. Um, I was quite excited to see that our Florida uh, le the state legislature, um, through a lot of work and, 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 and lobbying and hard work, um, we're able to allow uh, Medicaid payments for multiple visits in the same day in Florida Health Center so that the patient who comes to see me for primary care can see the psychiatrist and perhaps get um, uh, maybe see the eye specialist and, and before they leave um, because, again, uh, we want to make sure we don't lose every opportunity to provide a best service for our patients. I want to end up with um, maybe a few take-home messages um, that when all is said and done, I think that health centers will always be committed as safety net. Um, and as my boss, Mr. Buddhist Hadley, always says, um, he always reminds us patient care comes first, and we, we have to do all it takes to provide the best services for our patients. And I think we will we'll continue to be positioned to question the impact of health care reform and, and Medicaid expansion regardless of the direction they go in. But obviously, there will be a need for resources for capacity building. Um, and what is interesting to note, in, in, as is um, stated on this slide, there was an article in um, a, the Daily News clip on 10 care is worth the cost last year, in which um, they, they noted that expanding Medicaid to 225,000 people would save nine lives in Tennessee every week for the next 10 years. Now, you project that to potential Medicaid recipients across the U.S., that is huge. Um, and when you look at the fact that health centers take care of, as Don said, one in five of the low-income uninsured, almost all of whom will then have Medicaid, I think the implication is that health centers will save thousands of lives across the U.S. Um, every week with, with Medicaid expansion, certainly. And um, I think that it is, you know, it, 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 that's just what it's all about. It, it's all, it all boils down to life saved. And talking about the life of that 32-year-old mother of three who just lost a job, um, or the 64-year-old who's not yet qualified for Medicare, but who's on treatment for his diabetes and, and is not compliant, not getting care because they're just waiting to get Medicaid, or, or that child who needs shots, um, and, and doesn't fall into the right categories. I think it all boils down to saving lives, and I'm very excited that um, health centers are able to, to, be, to, to be a forefront in this effort. And as this slide indicates, in an article published in the New England Journal in 2012, you look across um, between 7,500 to 12,000 in each of the regions, lives would be saved in medical expansion. And I think that uh, with or without that, health centers will be there to be a part of this effort. 
as they um, position themselves to better serve the communities um, that we work in, in in the new healthcare system. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Don and Tony, for those wonderful presentations. Um, now we would like to open the floor for particip participant questions and answers. Uh, Melissa, Melissa Hansen from NCSL will be helping direct the questions to the panelists. As a quick reminder, to ask a question, please click on the Q&A button and type in your question in the box below. Please make sure you ask your question to all panelists and remember that the questions will remain anonymous. Uh, while we wait for any people to submit any questions they may have, I also wanted to make a quick announcement and remind every one of our participants today about an upcoming webinar. States help veterans access health benefits and save money too. Uh, this webinar will be on Monday, March the 11th at 2013, and you may register for it through the NCSL website. Great, thank you, Lonnie. With that, I will um, start the Q&A. This is a question um, directed to Don. Don, can you talk a little bit about the role of community health centers in the exchanges, whether they are state-run or federally run? Well, um, the role, uh, health centers obviously um, are well positioned to play uh, a role as navigators in the exchanges to ensure that um, patients and community members get access to the exchanges, um, helping with outreach and enrollment in that, that process. So um, I think health centers are involved all over the country right now as states prepare to implement the exchanges um, and you know, partnering with them on, on that implementation and preparing um, for the, the ramp up and you know, making sure people um, get coverage and access to care. Great, thank you. The next question is to Tony. Um, do the hospitals compensate your center for their for your assistance in preventing ER visits? That's a very good question. I think there are different models across the country, and so in my health center, uh, we do have um, some funding support from the local hospitals for specific programs. And while they may not define um, um, how they expect us to spend the money, they provide some capacity building for us to 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 um, support services that might keep patients out of the hospital. And so, so, for example, some of the funding we've had or we received from a couple of the hospitals has helped us maintain our urgent care centers, uh, which they've, they've found valuable um, in reducing the, the hit they have on their hospitals. So yes, we do receive some funding from our local hospitals, and there are quite a few hospitals across the country and health centers that have similar relationships. Great, thank you. This is a question maybe directed at both um, Tony and Lonnie, are health centers prepared to support child with adults? Do they have the sort of infrastructure to do that? And are states, and Lonnie, this might be directed to you, are states looking, um, looking at community health centers as sort of part of the safety net? Tony, do you want to take the first part of that question? Sure. Uh, if I heard you right, are we positioned to, act, to take care of childless adults? Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yes, okay. Yeah, um, all of us um, in terms of strategically planning to help position ourselves for healthcare reform and Medicaid expansion are looking at that, um, an influx of patients, you know, anyone, patients of all ages, especially, yes, childless adults, and looking at um, um, capacity building with additional sites, additional staffing, um, additional um, resources. So, so, yes, I think there's, there's a lot of effort in the ground level and across the country either starting to do that or, or looking for support to do exactly that. Um, in terms of safety net, yes, um, there's a lot of state support um, working with health centers to provide that safety net. Um, and, and in my health center, as well as other health centers across the country, uh, many states actually do provide some funding um, directly or indirectly to health centers, specifically setting up in in some underserved sites or providing services on top of what we might be funded by HERSA to provide, for example, um, as well as perhaps initiating additional programs, for example, um, emergency room diversion programs I've seen in some places, mobile, va uh, mobile health vans going into some more remote areas that don't have health centers 
um, and so on and so forth. Great, thank you. Um, does anyone have anything to add on that question? If not, I'll go ahead and move on to the next question, Don. This is a question for you. How do health centers fund enabling services like transportation and other non-medical services? That is something that is, you know is, is part of part of the health center um, cost and we, federal funding um, for uh, through the 330 uh, program um, can be used and um, it's part of their cost that um, in some cases are in some cases some services may be reimbursed um, by Medicaid as well it just it varies from state to state but and, and in some cases that you know. Depending on the services, they may a health center might seek a grant or state or local support to to support specific um, services as well. Great, thank you, um, Don. This is another question for you. What makes a geographic region underserved, and how would you find um, how would you find out about centers in your district, um, specifically looking at Maryland's Eastern Shore? Um, well, the Bureau of Primary Health Care has a health center locator on their website. I think, you, you know, you can put in your zip code and, and see. We also have information on the NAC website, www.nac.org, um, about where health centers are located across the country. And you'll find resources there as well about um, on both the Bureau's website and uh, NAC's website about um, how health centers are located in medically underserved areas. It, it is actually a somewhat complex um, <laughs> system in terms of, uh, it comes down to um, socioeconomic information as well as the number of providers in any given area. Um, so it's unfortunately it's not something I can just uh, explain um, in a sound bite, but um, there's lots of information available about how that is formulated. And um, if there's a community like the Eastern Shore where there's may not be an, uh, adequate access to health centers, um, a community can seek uh, health center funding from the federal government to get started and would encourage them to take a look at that process and we have information on our website again about how, how to go about that. Great. Um, the next question is for Tony. Tony, are health centers required to offer, offer dental care? All right, thank you for the question. All right, so health centers are required to have dental services accessible to their patients, which means that you either provide that directly or you provide that in the, uh, you, you have a local resource that provides that, but with a clear written agreement for what services they'll provide to a patient at a minimum, preventative dental services. Um, so that's that's what HESA's position is. In fact, um, to be to, to be eligible as a federally qualified health center or as a community health center, you must have um, an array of services that you provide directly. Dental is one of those where you either have to provide directly or you have, you, you have um, a, a source that the patients can go to where they can receive discounted services for which you have a defined referral agreement. Thank you. I think this will be our last question of the webinar, and this is directed at both Tony and Don. Um, can you talk a little bit about churn and ways that states and churn being sort of people moving between Medicaid and the exchange once those are op operational, about what health centers are doing to prepare for that or how they can help states with that? Don, do you want to start? Well, I think health centers are, are um, aware of that and, you know, concerned about that. and but have dealt with that a lot in the past and our focus is trying to provide, you know, continuous care and making sure that we keep folks um, enrolled in whatever coverage they might be eligible for. So providing uh, enrollment assistance, renewal assistance, and, you know, providing support as their situations change. And that's something that, the, you know, our um, local health centers do at the local level and our state primary care associations are engaged and it's a, a state level in terms of issues related to the exchange implementation, Medicaid expansion, and so forth to make this as seamless as possible for, for folks. Correct. And if, if I may do exactly that, um, the, that like Don said, the, the quite a number of things and, uh, health centers in the states are doing, um, uh, I mean, that obviously includes making sure that we, we present the best opportunity to be medical homes for patients, so regardless of 
the, the you know the insurance plans they're part of whatever exchange that we 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 exist to provide services for all of those. And I think health health centers are well spoken into health information exchanges and in terms of participation in those, as well as also um, being very aggressive in the development of and involvement in the development of health information exchange, um, making sure that we 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 are part of the discussions and the solutions to exchanging information across, so that even if patients change providers move move to other states, we get to a point where we we can actually um, um, easily obtain the patient's uh, health information or or submit to wherever they 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 need it to be um, to help maintain continuity of care. Great, thank you. That will conclude the um, Q&A session of the webinar. Lonnie, I'll turn the floor over to you. Okay, once again, I would just like to thank both of our speakers, Dawn and Tony, um, for taking the time out to do this webinar. Uh, this will conclude the webinar, and once again, I'd also like to thank all the attendees for your time and participation in today's conference, and I hope you all have a wonderful weekend.